Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today on our panel on moving towards environmentally sustainable operations with cloud native tools. I'm Nikki Manoledaki, I'm a software engineer at Waveworks. Um, I work on open source cloud native tools and I advocate for environmental sustainability initiatives at Waveworks. Today I'm joined by William Caban, who is global telco Global, sorry, <laughs> Global Telco Chief Architect at Red Hat, um, with over 20 years of experience with architecting um, telco solutions. We have Marla Weston, who is um, Cloud Software Architect at Intel, who is also Chair of the Environmental Sustainability Tag and works on um, resource management for Kubernetes. And we have Chris Slavery, who is Customer Reliability Engineer at Waveworks, who currently works with Deutsche Telekom and is a champion for GitOps um, operations and patterns. So we will focus mostly on carbon and energy optimizations, since that is what we need to do. Um, but we will also mention some cost and regulation and carbon and energy issues to state the problem. And we will also um, mention some communities um, that are part of the CNCF plus an ecosystem that you can join to continue the conversation. Uh, and lastly, also, we'll be mentioning cloud native tools throughout that can help with um, all of this. Um, so to ground ourselves with some numbers, the IPCC has urged um, global leaders and industry leaders to maintain um, the global temperatures at a level of 1.5 degrees Celsius. Currently, we are at an increase of 1.2 degrees Celsius. And the IPCC has also urged uh, global policymakers and industry leaders to reach net zero by 2050. Also, the um, um, International Energy Agency reported in September of this year that uh, data centers and data transmission networks each account for 1 to 1.5 percent of global electricity use. And the GSMA reported in 2019 that the telco industry consumed 2 to 3 percent of global electricity use. So with that in mind, William, how does the makeup of energy sources impact CO2 emissions on a global scale? So to start with this, let's put this into perspective from the telco, uh, telco area, right? So if we consider that 70 per that as telco industry, right, we are hitting 2 to 3% of the global energy consumption. Uh, at the same time, 70% of that is because of the RAN element, most of it on the antennas and the DU. Being telco, that also means that we are highly distributed by definition. So the energy sources have the following impact. For example, if we were just doing regular natural gas, that is about 0 0.9 uh, pounds per kilowatt hour okay, of CO2 emissions. Now the same DU, for example, using petroleum or coal, for example, on petroleum is 2.13. So that, that's 1.4 1 times more CO2. And if we are doing coal, it will be 1.5 times. So that gives you an idea on just by changing the energy source, what's the impact. In, for example, th there's areas that unfortunately due to the, either the realities on countries, for example, in, in China, where 60% of their power comes from coal, that, that means it's gonna be far more challenging, for example, achieving those goals of Net, uh, net zero by 2050, for example. So that's, that's how compositions of the different type of power source affect the, the CO2 emissions in general. Thank you. And Marlo, what are some existing, what are some examples of this existing challenge? 
some of the challenges? Is this even hearing me? It's just very quiet. Okay. Some of the challenges right now um, involve basically finding where the power is available. So currently in Texas, we have a whole bunch of wind energy all the way in West Texas, but we have no way for those transmission lines to get across. So right now people are looking at building data centers right next to those areas of energy. Um, if you look at Iceland, they have advertisements right now as of last week, they had an advertisement of build your data center here because they have hydropower and you don't really need much cooling because cooling takes a huge amount of your data center power. So there's some interesting challenges as far as getting the green energy to where it needs to be and maybe building the data centers more proximate will be a more sensible thing in the future. And compliance with CO2 emissions and regulations around that is another challenge, but also an opportunity for telcos to make a substantial difference. Um, William, what do we mean by scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions? Sure. So in last year, basically, in the EU, EU <laughs> in Europe, um, there was the adoption of, of this uh, new regulation that basically by 2015, companies need to be uh, reporting scope one and scope two. And the US, anything that is publicly traded is by 2024. They need to start reporting on 2023. Okay, so anything on 2024 about what happened in 2023. But what really are these scope one or two or three emissions? So scope one emissions is anything that the organization controls, controls or owns. So that can be from cars to data centers to cloud services that they control. Not, this, not necessarily the SaaS, but if you're doing IIS, yes. So it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, area there. So scope two is the CO2 emissions or are the CO2 emissions that are the result of generating the power that the organization consumes. So the CO2 emission of carbon, that will be, again, counted as part of the scope two. Now, what about the scope three? Scope three refers to everything else out there that, is that the organization is consuming and the CO2 emission by those. And that, for example, if it's a SaaS service, anything that, is, that that SaaS service is generating to provide the SaaS service, that's part of the scope three even the travels that we take, or the transmission lines that belong to a third party, or satellite connections, all of those, I mean, from, from the ground, all those uh, CO2 emissions, those are scope three. And guess what? So that started last year, now this year, and anything in the US need to report by 2024. So it catches by surprise but pretty much. There are pretty much no tools that we can use uh, properly to report on these for next year. That, that's the situation we are right now. And actually, what are some examples of regulations and policies that are in place that aim to tackle CO2 emissions compliance? Okay. So, <laughs> the European ESG is, is, is the one that is covering the European Union. Uh, in, in the US is the SEC, the one that basically is enforcing all this. In, in both cases, it's for any publicly traded company or organization. Uh, it's just that happened that, for example, contrary to Global Financial that has been preparing for years for this, uh, telco, not, well, there are some telcos are doing ex excellent work, but not all the telcos were ready to, to to start with this. Either. And so now that we've defined some of the terms and the problem statement, let's discuss some optimizations related to energy and carbon uh, use. Um, but first, Marlo, do you think that environmental sustainability and performance are at odds? Not today. So today, currently, we have so many inefficiencies within Kubernetes that we need to be focusing a little bit more on resource management and how we're handling it internally. Because we're not anywhere near uh, util utilizing the cores at their full capacity. So 
So we're running a lot of servers we don't need to have. So if instead we could scale back and figure out which servers and optimize the resources we have, we're actually saving energy at that point. Um, at some point, you are going to have to make a choice between performance and sustainability, but we're nowhere near there, at least not today. When you start looking at cooling, for instance, and you have hot spots in your data center, and you're not scheduling correctly, because we're so far from full utilization, you could just schedule a little more, more, in, more intelligently and keep the, your average temperature down so you don't have those hot spots to cool. So eventually, yes, sustainability and performance will be at odds, but not today. What about energy and carbon optimizations? Are they ever at odds? They can be. So if you're looking at hardware optimizations, right, you want to get the newest, greatest, most energy efficient, but really you're replacing old hardware. So what is the carbon cost of your old hardware that you're replacing versus the carbon cost of your new hardware that you're replacing? And how long is it going to take you to even that out? So you can look at it as, um, as you want the greatest, best and greatest, but you know, your, your gas guzzling car may still be fine compared to buying a new car as far as all the, all the resources you need involved. And so now let's talk about optimizations for carbon and energy at the node level. Um, I think it's Marlo, Chris, and then William. So as far as carbon and energy optimizations at the node level, currently the kubelet doesn't easily make it, doesn't make it easy to do power optimizations. You're still really uh, inefficient as far as your core utilization. So we need to be looking at better tools. We need to be basically pushing in. Um, I have a plug-in model that I can talk about offline with people later. Um, but basically make it, make your cores easily, more easy to utilize. So um, like Nokia has a CPU node pooler. Um, Intel CS CRM, I have a CPU resource management thing. There's a whole bunch of tools, but they're all external to the kubelet as far as optimizations. Those need to be moved into the kubelet. Um, yeah, I'm probably, uh, probably going to take a slightly different view on um, virtualization and runtimes and talk a little bit about um, the need to address the, the VM construct as we traditionally use it in, in certainly in telco and uh, BNF, and that hasn't really changed in a long time. Retains a lot of the like the the legacy of um, of, of emulating physical computers like peripherals, um, BIOS routines, and those things all made sense in a time when you needed to virtualize for a broad multitude of systems. But if we're just talking about running CNFs and and telco software inside Kubernetes, it's, it's much more specific a purpose. And what we've seen from WeaveWorks is that that's, that frames, it, that frames a, a problem in virtualization with interesting places to target um, that we could call boot and bloat. Um, micro VMs are a response to solving that aspect of resource usage through speed and through minimalism. And they streamline the boot process by removing things like BIOS routines and unnecessary peripherals in the VM, so the footprint and the overhead is dramatically reduced. Um, the, the solution that we've come to um, is called Liquid Metal and is an open source project inside Weaveworks, um, which allows you to utilize the same tools um, to build and run VMs uh, in conjunction with something like Cluster API and it's not opinionated about that runtime so that you can, uh, you can choose which micro VM runtime you prefer to use. You can bring a kernel and a distro that you prefer for your software stack. Um, you, can, uh, you, can, you can solve problems um, that are, well, let me think about how to phrase that. Um, you, can, you can create greater efficiencies by using something with a much smaller footprint, like how much, uh, how much um, resource your control plane is taking up, um, or having to repurpose and reuse, as Marlu said, where you might want to um, repave a whole physical segment of data center with Kubernetes, but you don't necessarily want to use a traditional heavy hypervisor. Um, yeah. I will take a different approach to this. For example, on the no level, I will call out <laughs> Let's stop the madness for a second. So, for example, I'm, I'm active on Oren, I'm active on TIP, not, not so much these days, but I'm active in several communities, 
And when we talk about power optimization, basically everyone starts talking, oh yes, let's do this in the DU such that we can shut down this course. And let's shut down those part in the antennas. Perfect, let's do that. So the antennas is in control of whoever provides antenna. So that means as community we have a zero say there. Okay, so we have to solve that. But what can we control? So let's go to the node level. And what happened at the node level is that, yes, let's shut down the whole thing except the node. Let's just leave it idle. How many of you know about the concept of a node power profile on the minimum consumption that a node will have even if it has no workload on it? And the reality is about 40% of the rated uh, power supply. So if you have a power supply of, let's say that is rated for 1,400, that means at least 564 watt will be consumed even if that node is doing nothing. So let's go back. All this time that we spend on, let's shut down everything so we utilize only this amount of that node. Are we really, because the OSC is something, but when we measure from, for example, go to the BMC and measure that power supply consumption from the wall, there's no reduction after those limits. So that means, yes, we can do optimizations, but we also need to be conscious of, okay, so after certain threshold, further optimizations are just consuming power that I'm not gaining anywhere. So I'm inviting basically the, the industry on this part. Let, let's be conscious of those and find better ways to expose those uh, metrics on what really is the minimum consumption of a node so that we can optimize for that. Uh, I have to call out, for example, as a very good example, uh, the recent work I've seen on, on Dell. Now you can go and query their iDRAC and they actually tell you based on this node, you will have a minimum of, in idle mode, this amount of watts, and based on the hardware that is here, this maximum. That, I can feed that to a machine learning model and optimize now. And I don't have to worry about shutting down every single code there. So it's a different way to, to look at this. Thank you all. And also, what optimizations are possible at the physical connectivity infrastructure? or at the workload level that have not been mentioned yet. I think it's first William, and then Marla and Chris will talk about hypervisors. Okay. So let me go back to uh, on, on the connectivity side. So on the connectivity, uh, we're doing a lot, uh, and, and we've recognized as industry that, for example, moving to fiber will help uh, quite a bit. Um, but on that, side as well, I, I would say, for example, let's be conscious of the whole aspect of it. Remember scope one, two, and three, and not just scope one, because something like hard disk or storage. So everyone knows that if you put an, a, a spindle, uh, it will consume more power than an NVMe or SSD. Yeah, sure, that's scope one. Let's go and look at scope three. It happened that for scope three, if we are looking at the spindle, it's three kilograms per terabyte. The SSD is 20 kilograms of CO2 per terabyte. So again, let's, let's be more conscious on when choosing those optimization uh, all across. So um, when we're looking at a lot of companies are using hypervisors um, in order to, to simplify the problem as far as uh, resource optimization. But it's not making it necessarily better because your workloads are, that hypervisor is still, I think it's around a 20% uh, cost for your resources. So you're still running into uh, cost of resources when you're using a hypervisor. Do you have more comments? Yeah, I mean, I think in conjunction with that, there's there's other there's other extended costs where we may be doing things in software that we might be able to 
um, we might be able to reduce or offload in the more performant areas of hardware going forwards and um, things like smart NICs, um, being able to utilize PCI pass through uh, and, and, and more modern um, software solutions that allow us to reduce the overall overhead, not just of hypervisors, but of act actual application functioning uh, or application um, usage itself within the guest. Um, so there's like a, there's merit in exploring both paths and we think that um, like what we really want to find is an optimum. So like I think we've both discussed mm -hmm. that there's there's the opportunity to remove the hypervisor altogether and use another kind of construct that is as effective and representative, but at the same time, from our perspective certainly and my perspective inside, you know, a large a large telco operator, is that's very difficult to do with the with the traditional means, we have to map everything to the new model, and, and we end up accommodating all of them, uh, if that makes sense to most people who are maybe running, you know, both OpenStack and VMware and physical and something else. That might be a fourth model. So we want to find a, a best blend, sustainably speaking, of um, where where it's great, where the problem is most elegantly solved. Uh, if that's in specialized NICs, if that's in um, uh, a host model that's as performant or more performant than a hypervisor model if that's in using a more, a more performant hypervisor in the first place. Although I think that you know better than I what that so means. Yeah, so hypervisors have a lot of constructs that are still left over from when we were using for them as virtual machines. So basically start looking at a model where we can t wrap up a set of resources and drop them into a container light object or a capsule and just run with that instead of continuing on this model where we're having to manage all the resources within each capsule, you would just drop them in. But we don't have that yet. <laughs> so um, what are some of the best techniques and tools um, that are exist currently for carbon and energy aware scheduling? Um, and smart workload placement. It's um, William first, then Marlo, and, and then Chris. Best techniques, I don't know, <laughs> but I know about tools that are trying to solve this problem. Uh, some more cloud native than others. Uh, but in general, for example, part of what uh, with my team has been working with uh, other partners is, for example, doing uh, workload placement on the MEC based on where the 5G slices are, are being really used compared to the traditional model of pre-provision. Uh, for example, the, the services that a 5G slice will consume instead of pre-provisioning it on, on a whole area, doing the in-time uh, provisioning of those based on, for example, if, if, if I have, let's say, a, a drone, a, a tractor, whatever, that is, is going from one area of coverage to another. So if, if we can track that and we track that properly, we can interact and pre-provision or provision in time when we know that it's going to be in that area, the, the, the workload closer instead of the traditional model that most of the time today just go and have to pre-provision the, the workload that's going to be consumed or the service in all possible locations that I want that service to be enabled. So that's, that's a technique that uh, is used and, and works well. Um, to add on to that, um, currently Kubernetes native doesn't have the ability to do scheduling by uh, particular metrics on the system. So we need to be looking at scheduling models that allow you to schedule according to various metrics. That's power, temperature. I'm sure there are other cases. Um, what workloads are there? So predicted temperature, if you're going to start uh, increasing that according to your workload. Um, so we need to be looking a little bit more at scheduling patterns. Uh, and, and to extend on that, I think that the carbon intensity data for electrical grids around the world, which is available through API providers like WattTime, um, they provide a marginal operating emissions rate, um, the more value 
that represents the pounds of carbon emitted to create a megawatt of energy. So the lower the more, the cleaner the energy. And schedulers and autoscalers can leverage those APIs um, to provision and scale workloads wherever is most carbon friendly, um, particularly for things like non-critical workloads, CI testing, um, mm -hmm. uh, those, those kinds of like QA um, staging. Um, there's, there might be more validity and application, but in the future we could potentially look at those actual CM APIs for deploying production workloads. Um, yeah. And I'd like to add one thing to that, um, that there's the, <laughs> I can not, <laughs> but um, there's, um, for example, in AWS and other cloud providers, we might not have accurate data on carbon emissions per region. Right now, we don't. Um, which would allow us to do scheduling for workloads that are running, for example, on EKS. Um, that's that's missing right now, but the APIs such as what time and electricity maps um, could help with that. Uh, there, one particular shout out that I would like to give is to the EU North One <laughs> region <laughs> because um, looking at you know, comparing different regions for their carbon emissions, it seems that's a partic that that one stands out because of the uh, fact that it runs in Sweden, I believe, which has qu quite a lot of its grid system running on renewables. So there, there are and there is information out there that you can gather right now. If even if you don't have API endpoints that you can consume to schedule your workloads on cloud providers. Um, so also, um, what cloud native tools? would you recommend for these use cases and optimizations? Um, there's a list of tools that we would like to, to mention to you. Um, Chris, first. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so I've looked at Carpenter, and uh, I think it's, it's a, a great example of something it takes, that takes a, an event-driven approach to right-sizing an undulating and dynamic amount of workloads to node pools. Um, in sustainability terms, we could use the concept of, of pools to um, create um, uh, create a model that um, accommodates um, those different different qualities depending on what the workload looks like, whether or not it can run on a more efficient or a more sustainable um, instance. Uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a unique perspective on that on on that problem set. Uh, and, th and the way that it works is by observing the aggregate resource requests of unscheduled pods and makes decisions to launch and terminate nodes to minimize scheduling latencies and infrastructure cost. Um, so it lowers cluster compute costs by looking for opportunities to remove underutilized nodes and uh, replace expensive nodes with cheaper alternatives. And in sustainability terms, we can ideally map some of that uh, cheaper to more environmentally friendly and cost effective. And whilst that won't necessarily be one-to-one, -one, um, there's gonna be opportunity. It's a pretty flexible um, tool to make that more sustainable centric, necessarily even than cost centric. So other tools um, to discuss, there's Kubatch, which is a queuing system basically um, that you can use for time of day. So you can choose when you schedule your workloads, especially if it's a high performance or AI ML workload. Um, there's one on, that's not on this list that I'm going to give a shout out to because we just released it um, called Intent Driven Orchestration. So you can schedule your workload according to intent. We're looking for feedback at Intel on that. Um, it's open source and was released on Friday. But that particular one lets you say, I want something of a low latency, so we'll schedule you accordingly. The example that we have running is uh, specific to performance, but you can also do something similar that's specific to power as far as uh, trying to optimize. There's Intel telemetry aware scheduling, which I know that uh, William is using in some of his prototypes that he's architecting. Um, that has to, but basically it lets you take on node metrics and then choose scheduling or descheduling decisions depending on those metrics. So that could be power, that could be temperature, it could be other things. And the other um, item that we're currently working on internal and will release in a couple of weeks, I was hoping we'd make it by now, but we didn't quite make it on time, is a CPU control plane that lets you have finer grained control of your cores over what you currently have today. Um, 
and it's semi-pluggable. Um, you still have to turn off all the Kublet stuff like you do with every other CPU manager, but it's hopefully a little more easily used. Some other tools. Um, so, Keda, uh, which allows you to do horizontal plot auto scaling based on metrics. And for example, right now we do have uh, two different POCs on doing CO2 base, uh, CO2 emissions base uh, auto scaling, horizontal auto scaling. Uh, Kepler, which is the tool that you see there on the, in the bottom. That's a tool that uh, we have been working in Red Hat with uh, others, uh, like IBM Research, Intel is also helped in there, Weaveworks, uh, which allow us to measure the actual energy consumed by a pod. Doesn't matter if the pod is running on bare metal, on virtual machines, or in the cloud. Now you can see, for example, uh, on the level of millijoules, how, m how much power is being consumed by that. And with that information, plus the APIs of CO2 emissions based on the power source, now we can have more accurate CO2 emissions metrics. So we have been experimenting on, on this mm -hmm. with some CNF, obviously because of the CNF uh, nature, it's kind of hard to, to auto scale, but for example, for UPF, it, it's something that it actually works. So for, for UPF and, and for other type of CNF that we can have more control on the scheduling, uh, it, it works pretty well. There's also the AWS Customer Carbon Footprint tool, which is not a cloud-native tool per se, so maybe it doesn't belong on this list, but it does merit a shout-out because it's a tool that is available globally. It's free to use. Um, there, Every cloud provider um, right now has a tool like this one that lets you visualize your carbon emissions and it's great for a yearly um, roundup of carbon emissions used that were used f to power your cloud um, resources. So whichever provider you're using, you could um, look for what they um, provide and if you're not satisfied with what they're providing, then please as customers, um, you know, be be vocal about it. Um, and also, um, how can our audience today get involved, learn best practices, and continue the conversation through um, communities that are in the CNCF ecosystem? Um, Marlo. So um, we just formed a new tag. Um, that's the environmental sustainability tag at the CNCF. And we're looking for people to help. We ha currently are putting together a landscape doc that documents all of the current tools available. It is not complete. We would like help, especially from people who have their own specialty tools, because there's a lot out there. Um, and there's also meetings every other Wednesday. The next one will be this coming Wednesday at 8 a.m. PST, 10 a.m. Uh, CST. We're in Eastern time. Eastern, 11 Eastern. Um, I'm usually translating across multiple time zones. So you're welcome to come to that and contribute and talk to us. There's also a Slack channel. There's a mailing list. There's a Twitter. We don't have a website yet, <laughs> but, but we're heading in that direction. Um, and that, that particular uh, body will also uh, direct you to being involved in other tools that you may be interested in, including Kepler, which I know is up for CNCF Sandbox. Um, I can mention, you know, I can mention the Green Software Foundation. Right. So Green Software Foundation, they have something called the SCI. That, that's an index on really what's the, the CO2 emission, basically not only by the workload, but by everything that workload consume. Uh, they also have the, the CO2 pipeline, which allows you to, for example, do static analysis of the code and based on that static analysis, they predict the CO2 emission that that software will be responsible. By the way, it will be great if the CNF can start providing that information uh, so we don't have to guess it. And the Carbon Aware SDK, which is, mm -hmm. is also part of, uh, do you have more information on that? I haven't played with that. <laughs> 
it's it's the standards, so they're looking for more more contributions to it. But it's it's fairly mature at this point. Um, I see him; he's over at Intel. He's he's the head of that thing, so he's been he's been pushing that. Yeah. So, um, like, uh, what I would say is sustainab sustainability adjacent um, would be um, the FinOps Foundation, and uh, mm -hmm. if FinOps is a new new term, you um, have taken this, um, I think, verbatim. But FinOps is an evolving cloud financial management discipline and cultural practice that enables organisations by helping engineering, finance, technology, and business teams to collaborate on data-driven spending and budgeting decisions, and it's a, a practice that's a f that it's a practice of cloud financial management and is focused on evolving standards through empowering community with education and advocacy. Um, so a few statistics uh, are that is 7,300 plus individual members and two and a half thousand companies enlisted. So it, there's certainly uh, a sizable amount of weight behind it as a movement, and with the high correlation between cost and environmental sustainability means there's heavy overlap between the two topics. Um, so in many ways, FinOps is a good foundation for sustainability where, where um, FinOps can create organizational awareness and benefit that a sustainable perspective can overlay and build on top of those tenets. And last but not least, there's also the GitOps uh, working group, um, which is part of the CNCF. Um, and we're just creating a subgroup for environmental sustainability to um, look at how GitOps can be used to facilitate um, the deployments of green tools and schedule them, uh, well, configure them and, um, and make them available um, in all environments. And we'll, we're also going to be looking at um, how to use Kepler um, as a, with GitOps as a, a use case. Um, to gather energy data and compare um, different architectures that are GitOps based um, with Kepler and look at um, how GitOps can help with uh, different power models like um, turning IT off um, because GitOps helps with that and power models such as idle and low power models and, and, and yeah, look at, at that. Um, lastly, um, as closing remarks, uh, we will each highlight one ask or next step that we would like to, to see or that we think should be the next step in the direction for moving um, operations in a sustainable direction. Um, so my ask is for um, more carbon and energy um, data to be available from cloud providers, so like the AWS Customer Carbon Footprint tool, which is console only. It, there's no API for it. It would be really great to have API endpoints that um, we can consume uh, so that we can improve scheduling based on that information. Also, that tool has a lag of three months, so the data of my energy, my carbon emissions today will only be available in three months from now. So I don't have the ability to, you know, make optimization based on that. And other tools that we have, like the What Time API or electricity maps, they're great, but they give estimates. So we can't rely on estimates. We need real data about carbon emissions and energy usage to be able to act on those. Um, Chris? Sure, so I've been back and forth on what the big ask um, that I could list would be. Um, and I think the biggest ask is, is really that those, um, those working in a co-location providing infrastructure um, really take a, a holistic look at, um, at their power sources and, and ask themselves questions organizationally about whether or not they can either participate in, uh, in enabling um, things like renewables um, in conjunction with building new data centers uh, or, or they can use existing renewable options. And I know that's a really tall ask, but I think that's part and parcel of where, where things are at. And even though they're not software centric, they are organizational centric and they are front and center of, um, of the topic. Uh, so yeah. Okay, for me, it's gonna be metrics, about metrics. So, in particular, 
for example, in, in the telco, we measure everything, but a lot of that goes to a data lake that no one looks <laughs> after a while. So think about this. So we do have now a ton of microservices and services. We have the 5G core, highly distributed. Um, we capture everything, but who can tell me how much power is consumed between the communication between two of those CNF? We have the data <laughs> somewhere. So we need to, to create something that is kind of a specification where we can start augmenting or enhancing, enhancing our metrics data with, for example, what's the actual power consumption of a path such that we can use that as part of the decision to schedule or reschedule workload based on the penalties or the goals on the organization. Is, is the organization trying to do reduction of CO2 emissions? That would be one path. But if they are trying to be more power efficient, that might not necessarily mean uh, less CO2 emission. So all of that today we know is possible, but we don't have a way to, to read or obtain that data. And I mean, if anyone knows about any project or is interested on, on starting something on, on the environmental sustainability, that's the type of tools that I would love for us as community to, to bring up. And for my part, I'd like to see smarter cooling models. So currently, uh, we are optimizing according to voltage use and you know, cooling. We just blast until the chips are cool enough. Sometimes we have direct two chip cooling, and that helps but you still end up with hot spots in your data center. So we need to get a little bit more intelligent as to how we're doing the cooling. The cooling is overwhelmingly 30 to 55% of your use as far as your data center, um, which is a huge percentage. It's much more than your Xeons. It's more than your network. That, that's the thing that if you're looking for easy, easy places to optimize, I would start looking there first. And so um, I think we have some time for Q&A, right? We have like eight minutes and before we move on to that I'd like to mention that we have a survey for the environmental sustainability tag you can scan the QR code up there and we would really love um, some responses from from all of you in the audience um, especially telco related information that would really help us um, yeah so we have seven minutes for Q&A Thank you. Uh, very interesting panel discussion. Um, I just want to ask a, maybe a stupid question. Is it all about CO2 emissions? If you think about data centers, you can put them in a cold place like Iceland or put them under the ocean or whatever, but they're still generating heat. Heat warms the oceans, melts the polar ice caps, etc. So do we need to think beyond CO2 emissions and also about heating? Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> on the other side, uh, telcos answer or are driven by regulations. And what's driving right now, everything is that there's a regulation that everyone needs to comply with, which is reporting about CO2 emission. Personally, I, I don't believe in the, in the financial tricks of reporting <laughs> CO2 emission, like by buying credits, I, I don't believe on that. You're just offsetting the problem. Uh, energy efficiency, for me, is far more important uh, at this time. And it's not because that will lead necessarily, lead necessarily to power reduction. Because, I mean, if, if we go to the numbers, I mean, just numbers, 5G is what, five to 10 times more power efficient than 4G? But on the other hand, it requires, what, up, up to 80 or 100 times more antennas <laughs> to cover the same area. So I would like to tackle that type of problem more than the CO2 only. But CO2 is what drives today the, the need or, or the activity, let's say. So yes. Anybody else wants to take that on? Do we have? Um, do we have other questions from the audience? Yeah, thank you. Maybe this is uh, also a bit silly question, but don't you think that uh, like clouds and all of these abstraction layers 
and uh, sustainability is in contradiction. Like when we have more and more abstraction layers, then the solution is less and less effective. So right now we're really inefficient when we're talking about cloud. Um, so I think that I'm going to kick that, that question down the road and ask that we get better at using the resources we have. So we're still building bigger and better, bigger data centers because we're trying to intake more data, but we're not you know, fully utilizing our compute power. And so if you look at the studies on it, we're using something like 40% of the compute power at best. Um, and that doesn't include optimizations. So if we start looking at optimizations, maybe we don't need more compute power. Maybe we can just keep going with what we have, but use what we have. And just to, and just to extend that a little bit, I think another part of that is um, like front loading, like physical infra, um, traditional model, like vertical monolith, um, you know, big iron kind of thinking um, versus the more distributed and dynamic, the more elastic cloud that we want at the node level um, or the service level um, is a good way of thinking about utility because we're investing a lot even just in the physical infra and then it stays underutilized for potentially months mm -hmm. if not years whereas if we're able to reach operating models where we're actually distributing that across the nodes and we're distributing different layers of um, functionality at the node level um, and we're able to manage that, then the utility of that no on a per node basis is higher and that is ultimately probably going to eke out as more sustainable. This is, oh, sorry, kind of in a similar vein. Um, you know, if anybody else besides William is in some of the standards bodies or working groups, but William, I'm kind of curious, like, from an ORAN perspective, what kind of comparisons are being done for, like, an ORAN deployment, power consumption-wise, what that footprint looks like versus a traditional RAN model? So in, in ORAN in particular, there are three <laughs> uh, that I'm aware of right now. So in working group four, which is more from the network perspective, and that's about shutting off, I mean, shutting off the, the antennas, et cetera. Working group six, which is more on the O cloud side and how the O cloud, for example, shutting off cores and, and, and be more optimal on that. Uh, and, and the third one was about orchestration, but I think that's more on the research, not, not yet. Uh, no. Yeah, th that's not, not an area. So basically, there's, there's a new, working group, well, it's not a working group itself, but <laughs> uh, which is about research, about the next generation research uh, for ORAN, in particular work, uh, 6G plus. So there, there has been some discussions on, on that area, but uh, not in that particular, like, okay, so let's compare a traditional model versus an open RAN versus even an ORAN. So what exactly it will look like. Uh, Proprietary or more profit, not more, more than proprietary, uh, specialized chipset can always be optimized more than engineering, uh, like a COTS. So that's a reality we have to live in. Uh, we just probably need to be far better at asking from our CNF vendors to adopt more cloud native constructs for real, not. I, I love what if I was saying it's like for real do cloud native so that will help <laughs> um, I think that's the, all the time we have for today um, thank you for joining us today thank you to our panelists and uh, yeah let's continue this conversation thank you, thank you.